Okay, um, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Marcel, and this is my colleague Charlie. We both work with HIGIT, um, a nonprofit research institute in Heidelberg, Germany. And yeah, welcome to the workshop on the SketchMap tool participatory mapping using OpenStreetMap, um, but creating features beyond OpenStreetMap. Um, quick uh, agenda how we envision this 60 minute workshop with you. Um, first, we talk you through the SketchMap tool what is it about? Um, we present you like how you can use it um, and also talk about the use cases for the tool we envision. Um, and then um, uh, Charlie will walk you through how to use the tool and we'll also have a hands-on session with three uh, fictional scenarios for you to, uh, for you to um, um, experience uh, firsthand how the tool works. And of course, in the end, we will have a closing um, on uh, brainstorming uh, use cases and envisioning you know, the future of participatory mapping. Um, so what's the SketchMap tool all about? Um, so basically it's a website, a, a web tool. Um, it's a dual paper-based digital collection of local knowledge. By you, I mean, like with the tool, you create a PDF map based on OpenStreetMap, and you can, of course, digital annotate it, or print it out, annotate it, upload it back to the website, it's georeferenced, and then also your annotations are automatically extracted. Um, I think some of you are familiar with field papers, and this um, tool is heavily inspired by field papers. Um, although it roots uh, are in a research project from six years ago, and some requirements were different in field papers. Um, so, for instance, um, it's also about local knowledge, it's also about um, collecting um, community. Um, Knowledge, um, no remote mapping, but field mapping. Um, but one big requirement was like not a top-down approach, for instance, like some stakeholders create the map, create the AOIs, but um, more of having um, larger maps like A1 printouts, A0 printouts, and then having um, communities um, discussing together. Um, um, uh, for instance, um, this project was um, in uh, re remote Brazil, and it was about um, capacities within communities, like mapping these facilities, um, and also um, flood risk management. So features like flood extents that don't necessarily end up in open street map. Um, yeah, and also uh, one point is also to make this process repeatable um, across different regions in Brazil. Um, this was also a requirement. Um, so this is the SketchMap tool in action. Um, on the top left, you see a very early map used in the Brazil project. Um, on the top right, you see um, how this uh, community um, interactions look like. Um, you can see like people um, discussing together um, critical infrastructure in their communities and how they're exposed uh, to flood risk. Um, yeah, so this was the first prototype, and then we. Um, Got in contact with uh, German Red Cross and the International Federation of the Red Cross Red Crescent Societies. And there was a follow up project um, improving the tool. So, this is on the bottom uh, left. Uh, there was a project also flood risk in um, Mozambique. And then on the bottom right, um, this was in Madagascar. It's all, um, yeah, were projects where we developed the tool further and also used it more in the field. Um, Think about the software stack. So, software is built in Python. Um, it's basically a class uh, web backend. Um, and the main task of the tool is, as I said, create the maps and download them. In. And um, if you're done with your with your mapping, um, upload it back and the georeferencing and the automatic extraction. This all happens with a um, salary task scheduler. And it all happens. Um, it also needs to be asynchronous and parallel as you have multiple users. Um, maybe some uh, brief words about how the automatic extraction of um, annotations happens. Um, Charlie will work you through that in uh, detail, but basically you create your extent you're interested in, you download your PDF map, you get a QR code, you save it also in, the, in our database. Later when you upload it, the QR code is matched again, and then a diff is created with um, your scan and the original map. And then we take the gray value out of your annotations. And then this way, we can also differentiate between different colors. So maybe you have the use case of, OK, I'm um, critical, critical infrastructure mapping. Um, and you choose a 
um, distinct color for health related and others for um, like social facilities, for instance. And there's also a quality report plugin. Um, this is a different um, service um, we build and maintain in our um, research institute. I talked about that earlier in a um, in a lightning talk. This is called um, the OQT or Awesome Quality Analyst. Um, it's a platform where um, different quality indicators based on OpenStreetMap um, are um, yeah, come together um, with intrinsic and extrinsic um, uh, quality checks. Um, for the sketch map, we don't use all the quality indicators, um, just um, the coverage and uh, currentness of the road network and amenities. And of course, um, it always depends on the use case. Um, we don't need a perfect map for the sketch map to use. We don't need a super uh, uh, complete map. Um, but of course, we need to, depending on the use case, um, the participants to or to be able to orient themselves on the map. So of course you can do that by just looking up your area of interest and deciding like that subjectively by yourself. So this is just an like added database um, uh, yeah, decision support. Um, yeah, and Charlie will walk you through how to create your map and yeah. So yeah, imagine here we're trying to start a project. First, you would go to our website, sketch-map-tool.hygate.org, and the first thing you're going to see are these two options. And so on the left-hand side, you see create a sketch map, and on the right-hand side, digitize your sketch map. So you digitize, that's the second step after you've already done your annotation. So you're going to start on the left, and you're going to create your own sketch map. From there, you're going to have to select what your area of interest is. So here, this is from a project we did in Somaliland. We're looking at Hargiza. We have a paper format of A4, an orientation of landscape. A lot of that's going to detail determine what you want to actually do in your project. So if you're doing each individual is doing their own map, maybe A4 makes sense. If you're doing a group format, something larger might be better. And from there, you're going to go on to the next scene after you've selected it. This is going to take a minute or two to load. And then you can have on the left-hand side, the quality report. And on the right-hand side, the actual sketch map template. The quality report is what you just mentioned. It makes sense to download both of it. But if you already know you aren't too concerned with the data, you could skip that. But, you know, the actual sketch map, the output, is the download PDF on the right-hand side. From there, what you can get is this. So here you can see a few different versions of that Hargiza project we did. So you can see here we have a large format on the left, a smaller one, and then again, uh, portrait orientation. And the key thing here is just you want to modify it to what your purpose is. It, you know, if you're doing something that's specific, you can always change it to that. And here you can see the QR code that Marcel mentioned as well as some small globes on the outside that's actually going to be used for the georeferencing. In terms of the data quality report, we use a basic traffic sign signal. So green, everything's okay. Yellow, maybe there's something to pay attention to. And you have separate ones for the different indicators. And again, it depends on your project. If you care about the roads, pay attention to that indicator. If that doesn't really matter and you care more about amenities, there's a separate indicator for that. So this is more so if that is important to your project. This doesn't, for many projects, you won't even care about the quality report. It's just what your purposes are. So now that you actually have your map, here's one where we've already completed it. In this case, we digitally drew on it. You can do it either digitally or in any type of editing software, such as paint, or you can actually manually yourself draw on it with a marker. And here we've drawn three circles or three polygons, right? And so you're going to take this and now you need to take a picture of it, maybe scan it on your, through a computer, and you're going to be uploading it to the website. So you go back there, imagine we had clicked on the right-hand side where it said digitize your map, and it's as simple as dropping a file in there. You need a PNG or a JPEG, it won't accept other formats. And one thing to consider is sometimes the, the data, the, the photo quality, you generally need 72 DPI or higher, larger format, you don't wanna to go too high because then it might run into an issue where the file's too heavy. You can handle up to 500, 500 megabytes, you have mini files or mini maps. But on an individual one, you don't really want to go much higher than 50 megabytes, which for most purposes, you're probably not uploading an image that's 50 megabytes, I would say. The output of that is that you have a GeoTIFF, the raster, and that is just exactly a GeoTIFF scan that's georeferenced of your actual sketch map. And on the right-hand side are the extracted vectors that are going to match what the extents of those polygons you just saw were. And that's in the GeoJSON format. So here you can see the GeoTIFF, that raster, and on the background, you have an OSM layer, and you can see that it's already georeferenced for you. So say if you had taken handwritten notes, like you might in field papers, 
this would be a time where that might make sense. But if you actually care more so about the vectors, then you would actually really care about the GeoJSON. And here it's already extracted. There are times where the GeoJSON might not work perfectly. And in that case, you can go back to this and manually input it in your GIS software of choice. But generally speaking, this should work out well, uh, so long as your, your markers are cooperating and you have a good scan of it. In terms of our use cases that we've done so far and we've considered, we've done it a lot with flooding, especially with uh, Red Cross, Red Crescent societies. But you can also use it for perceptions of heat islands, dangerous roads and safety assessments, as well as mapping critical infrastructure, community networks, urban and community development, and public sentiment mapping. As we just saw actually in one of the previous presentations, they were looking at the map amenities. You really can, you know, anytime you're taking any type of annotation of a map, you could adapt that to this purpose. It's really whatever you want to make it be. The goal is that it's a simple way to digitize, georeference, and extract vectors from a handwritten object. So some of the common pitfalls, we can recognize a few colors right now. Red and blue will be your best ally. Those work the best. And you can use multiple colors, though it will sometimes throw certain errors. We had one recently where I was using red, blue, and green. And for some reason, it just wasn't differentiating the green. It was recognizing the object, but it was just not seeing that it was a different color. But we have another one where it's red, blue, and pink. No problem. So it's just something that we're working on right now. These are the colors that are going to work best. So red, blue, green, yellow, turquoise, and pink. Another thing to pay attention to is how you're doing your polygons or your drawings. So on the left-hand side, you have that reverse C. If you were mapping a road or river, that'd be totally fine. But if your purpose here was to do a circle, you really want to make sure to complete that polygon because it's going to read it as that. The vector output will be what that looks like. So again, if it's a road, totally okay. But if you wanted that to be a circle, you really need to complete it. It's the same thing with the one next to it. This might be just a simpler way of filling it in, right? But what that's going to read as is a circle along with two separate lines in there. And so you just, if that's what you want, Great, but just be mindful of what you're drawing. It's going to take it quite literally. And then the same thing with that so the one in the center. The issue there was that it's going to start reading that top part of it as kind of a faded line. So some of those pixels are going to read in as a green. Some of them won't read in. The geotip will pick it up, but you just want to be careful that you're having a full completion there. And so the bottom, the, the two on the far right side are really what you're aiming for. So either a simple outline or a fully filled in circle or whatever your shape will be. You can do a square, it's all the same. Another thing to pay attention to is the print and scan quality. So as Marcel mentioned, we're doing a difference uh, approach. So it's taking the original one you have and it's taking your scan and it's looking at the difference in the pixels there, right? And the colors. So if you have a very dark image, it might have some issues reading those actual colors. And the same thing goes when you're looking at the quality of the image. We have to register the QR code and then it has to take in those georeference globes that you can see on the edges. And if those aren't quite visible because your scan was poor or your image was poor, that could cause a problem. Generally speaking, nowadays, cell phones are pretty good. So, so long as the room is pretty well lit, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. But it's just something to be careful of, especially in circumstances where you might not have the best equipment available. So here are those globes I mentioned. You can obscure these and it can potentially mess with the georeferencing. So we have quite a few of them, so there's a lot of redundancies. But say if too many people were to draw them, then that you might have some issues with it actually georeferencing properly. So the goal here is that you shouldn't be marking on those. Shouldn't be too much of a problem, but again, just something to be mindful of. Okay, so that was pretty much the walkthrough.